Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Apocalypse's Historia, if, in, with another entry to our Shakespeare authorship series. Uh, here on the scene, we have our usual suspect, Chance, and myself, Brady, and uh, this episode is one I've been looking forward to a while, and unfortunately, this is our second time recording it. It seems like I keep getting worse at some of the technical stuff as we make more videos, which doesn't make sense, but, uh, you know, so it goes, and... Um, Prior to our uh, to our initial recording, we were it was before we had a hundred subs, but now, as you can see, uh, upon this recording, we are over the hundred sub mark. So yeah, I just wanted to say a big shout out and thank you to everyone who's been liking and uh, commenting so far, providing more of those awesome breadcrumbs and rabbit trails uh, holes for us to find. So uh, hope I really hope that you'll enjoy this episode as well. I think we have a lot a lot. To chew on with this one and hopefully uh, with some people uh, will be answering some questions at the same time and providing uh, maybe some new insight to things uh, and really convincing arguments and once again we'll be pulling out some deep dive essays and arguments from from the olden days and bringing them up to the to the to bring them up to speed with some new uh, some fresh angles and uh, if you stick around to the very end I've got some of my own wacky theories to uh, to uh, throw into the ring here, very uh, unacademic friendly maybe, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So without further ado, I'll uh, hand off the microphone. Howdy, howdy, folks. Uh, welcome back. As Brady said, uh, had some technical difficulties. We did record this episode once before, and uh, we recorded it with two microphones. So it came out like, you know, it was bad. Try, try um, around, yeah. But uh, the good news is, is last time we recorded it, we recorded it along with our other most recent episode and we also did not have a camera in that episode uh so now we do have a camera so that's the good news um so yeah welcome back folks uh thanks for watching uh thanks for tuning in if you didn't see the last video the group theory wins uh go check this one out uh it's a little helter skelter but we're trying to connect a lot of different dots and uh just show that there's a lot of different thought on the internet about how to approach this question and if you are stuck in a solo candidate theory you may get some really great analytical in information but you're not going to have the context to make sense of it and you're going to end up having a very incomplete view um let's see moving on i uh, want to give a couple shout outs uh to some of our commenters anderson uh you've been reading malcontent so i went ahead and picked up my copy i'm only through act one <clears throat> but um, I've been reading some Peter Buckridge essays, and he has a lot of essays on the Elizabethan era, but uh, his essays uh, specifically on Marston have been rather elucidating, and he points out that uh, there's a lot of connections between Marston and uh, Darby, uh, William Stanley, because, you know, he's writing out of St. Paul's, and uh, that's where Darby's men's playing. Um, also, Marston maybe comes up through... Um, Fernando Stanley's wife's family and so maybe that's his connection through there uh, that maybe points to me that maybe we have a front man writing for Stanley so when we you know see that William Stanley in that secret service letter uh, about William Stanley says he's too busy uh, pinning comedies for the, the you know common folk or whatever common comedies or whatever it is that it said uh, maybe that's a nod that he's the one writing these Marston plays um, that said, it seems like the malcontent, you can make readings that are like anti-Darby or anti-William Stanley and also anti-Oxford. And so we have uh, our character, Bilioso, who's kind of like almost uh, Malvolio-like uh, from Twelfth Night. He's a little older and a little uh, maybe grosser, not as refined or foppy as Malvolio, but... Um, uh, he's called several times an old ox. Uh, he says, old Duke's ox. I called the old ox. And then he calls him a bunch of other nasty names. Uh, and then also in scene four, we get this description from Celso, who is supposed to be Malevole, the main character's best friend and the only one that Malevole trusts because Malevole is really the banished Duke Alto Fronto, which Alto Fronto means high front. Um, you know, like a front from high up. Just saying. Um, and so Malevole, a.k.a. Duke Altafronto, is telling Celso why, or when he was banished, and uh, it's where he's been. And Celso uh, explains to him like why he's been banished. And he says, 
Strong with Florence, I, thence your mischief arose. For when the daughter of the Florentine was matched once with this Pietro, now duke, no stratagem of state untried was left till you of all. And so he's saying, look, you were duke, and then this other guy that usurped you, that became duke, he, it happened because he teamed up with this other guy by marrying his daughter. Um, now, granted, this Florentine is not the Bilioso that's called the old ox. So, you know, if this is a reference to Oxford, we have kind of two different references. So I don't know how parsimonious that is. But still, um, this may point to when William Stanley um, starts trying to get to marry Elizabeth Vere and then finally does marry Elizabeth Vere. And right around then is when Ferdinando is supposed to have died. So maybe there's a, um, some connection there. Um, but yeah, here we go. What though I called the old ox, egregious whittle, broken-bellied coward, rotten mummy. And so... Uh, doesn't like this guy. Um, so maybe there's some uh, jabs at Oxford in here. I don't know. Uh, so that's for you, Anderson. Shout out. Uh, anybody else wants to pick up Malcontent, please do. And uh, please see if you can uh, read some stuff into it. Because uh, it definitely seems like Marston has some uh, cryptic allegorical jabs, despite the fact that the prologue to this play tells you not to read any allegory into it. Um, which almost makes me want to read allegory into it. Uh, let's see, Mr. Abzu, thanks for posting, and uh, thanks for the Bassano shout-out. Um, in another video, I think I was asking, like, please, folks, tell me about Amelia Lanier Bassano, because I don't know enough. I've read some of her poetry, not been super impressed by it, uh, didn't see anything too similar to Shakespeare, but then um, now that I've looked back into it, um, not necessarily her poetry, but her biography matches up real well, and um, there's a lot of names in Shakespeare that mimic. Emilia Bassano, so like uh, Othello, we got Emilia's Iago's wife, and then uh, uh, we have Bassanio, which is uh, one of the sort of noblemen of uh, Venice, I believe. Um, so uh, there may be something there, and then uh, Mr. Abzu said specifically, like, check out John Webster, because this whole time I've been trying to link Mary Sidney to Webster, uh, but Emilia Lanier maybe also fits or fits even better with John Webster, so that's an interesting link. I'll look into that further. And uh, any other folks out there reading your Webster know you're Amelia Lanier, give us a shout out. Um, <clears throat> and also, Amelia is a character in the Malcontent, and it may sort of mirror the Amelia character in Othello, so maybe there's some overlap here too. Um, let's see. And then, Roughneck, I uh, wanted to give you some uh, book rec shout outs. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Not that far into this one, but Nabokov's. Ada, Ardor, um, and there may be a longer title version to it, but Ada or Ardor, and uh, so far very meta fiction y, um, a lot of speculative fiction or proto speculative fiction, but it's Nabokov, so it's like, you know, pretty highfalutin, but yeah, just reading uh, Nabokov or Nab N Nabokov, or I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but reading him is a, a special treat and. Uh, he has uh, such a way with words and syntax. It's always fun no matter what he's writing about. Uh, let's see. Another one is The Sunlight Dialogues by John Gardner. Um, everybody knows this more famous Grindel. Grindel's uh, novel is okay. It's just like almost this like experimental short story thing. Uh, but this is a hulking tomb that has all these sort of uh, character lists. And uh, it gets almost... Uh, you know, non-ergodic and that sort of thing. Um, only a few pages into that one, but uh, I, I'm enjoying it so far. It's It's got this uh, Middle America feel, but it's mixing in a lot of uh, 60s, you know, uh, Eastern mysticism and that kind of thing to it. So I'm interested to see where that goes. It seems like it's pretty anthological. So there's a lot of different characters over different times in it. Uh, and then... Uh, Davis Grubb, um, if you don't have time to read all of Ancient Lights, which uh, I may not, I'm only about 50 pages into that one as well, but that one's wacky, wacky. This one's po uh, published posthumously. Uh, he was working on it when he died, and the book opens up by saying, you know, uh, that, that guy's name on the front, don't worry about him. It's really written, this whole book's really written by this other character named Swilly, Swilly Leach, and uh, that Davis Grubb guy, yeah. 
uh, we just put his name on it because he's dead. And it's like, how do you write that into your own book? No, I guess he knew he was going to die or something. But uh, if you don't have time for that one, check out Night of the Hunter. It's one of his way earlier 50s novels that gets turned to a movie with uh, Robert Mitchum. Uh, the movie's pretty good, too, so check out that movie. Um, and then uh, Augustus John Williams. I said I started this, and then I had to put it down because I guess I'm just not buffed up enough on my Roman history to really appreciate it. And so any of you folks that are buffed up on your Roman history, uh, read Augustus and let me know. Because um, I do like John Williams. Uh, Stoner's awesome. Uh, Butcher's Crossing's awesome. So. Plus, yeah, it's a New York review book. So, yeah, always uh, going to love those. Uh, and it's uh, the first winner of the National Book Award. So uh, usually those aren't good. But uh, John Williams seems to usually be good. So we'll see. Oh, and to foreshadow, speaking of New York book reviews i don't know if i said i finished it but the long ships by swish author swiss not swish swiss swiss author uh franz g bentingson uh wrote the viking romp the long ships and it's yeah i don't think it's as cerebral as all the ones that he just mentioned but dang it is it is a fun romp and there i you once you've also read uh, or seen or become acquainted with enough of the like Viking sagas, you can kind of see where he's obviously used a bunch of the saga pieces, his little vignettes, his, his little scenes in his uh, in his book. Or for instance, also in this book, it came out in, like the 40s. Um, if you've watched The Northmen, which is also Shakespeare related slightly, you know, through the Amleth Hamlet story. But yeah, in the Northman movie, there's that scene in the trailer where a dude throws a spear and then the main character kind of grabs the spear, you know, mid-shaft and then turns it around and throws it back at the enemy. And he uses that scene in the book, and then, but that is also just a famous scene in one of these uh, these uh, sagas, essentially. So a lot of reborrowing and, re and reusing, but uh, yeah, to maybe for foreshadow uh, what my talk will be about later in this podcast episode. Uh, but yeah, shout out to the Northman. I love that movie based on the the Danish saga, I believe is what it is, of uh, Amleth. But this is obviously what the Shakespeare play Hamlet is based on. Not the long ships, but yeah. <laughs> Shout out. All right. Uh, let's see. I want to start our video by uh, going back to the Henslow diary. Because uh, in the last video we had, we... At the end, we we're like, who's Thomas Decker? Who's Thomas Decker? Well, that's kind of what we want to talk about today. But in order to do that, let's start by looking at his role. And we know his role because of this Henslow diary. We also have his name printed on a bunch of plays. Uh, there are letters and stuff about him. Um, so we know that whoever Thomas Decker's is, a big De Decker, Dickers, Deckers, whatever you want to say, uh, big time playwright. Um, he is the most prolific playwright, maybe of the entire era, uh, but definitely in this Henslow diary. Uh, uh, Harry or Henry Chettle is a close second. Uh, Drayton's a close third, and then sort of distant fourth is Monday, and then uh, yeah, you have some other ones, Richard Hathaway, William Houghton, uh, Wentworth Smith, that, that, that crowd, uh, which we don't have much printed from. Um, let me see. Let me bring this up over here. Here's my... Uh, fancy little infographic chart on Thomas Decker. Um, here's uh, our likeness. Yeah, let me move it over a little more. Here's our likeness of him. Thomas Decker, <clears throat> uh, said to be born in 1572. We only know that from uh, taking very literally a statement. He said late in the six, uh, like 1620s or 30s that he'd been alive for so long and people backdated that and said, oh, he must have been born in 1572. But we don't actually know that if he was or is, that's uh, supposed to be the same age as Ben Johnson, so that's interesting. Uh, it's going to be eight years younger than Shakespeare and Marlowe, going to be 18 years younger than Sidney and Greville, going to be a full 22 years younger than Oxford, so just to give you a little mental picture. Uh, let's see, but still, you know, eight years older than, say, William Herbert or John Webster. Uh, let's see. What did his father do? No, <laughs> don't, don't even ask. We don't know. Religion? Uh, you know, maybe you can try and suss that out in the plays, but Decker's so, uh, you know, sarcastic and satirical and, uh, you know, probably just his answer would be no, no religion or something. Uh, possibly went to grammar school. I mean, we have to assume that because clearly super literate guy, uh, you know, what did he do? He's a playwright. We don't know anything else about him. Other than went to prison a couple times for debt, 
And then, apparently in prison for seven years in the 16 teens. I don't know how true or not that is, but it's supposed to be because of a debt to John Webster's father. Like, I don't even understand. How is this guy one of the most famous playwrights in, in England? And, like, he's uh, his, you know, best co-writer, John Webster. That guy's dead. <laughs> Is like suing him for forty pounds, and putting him in jail for seven years. What the? F- uh, that sounds like total hogwash. Uh, but we'll have to look into that at some point further. Marriage? Who knows? Uh, there's some guy that had three daughters that was named Thomas Dickers. Um, but there's no reason to believe that that's the same guy or the same people. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, patrons? Uh, you know, all these other people like Ben Johnson. Uh, to to the Lady Clifford or, or to uh, Sir William Herbert or you know that sort of stuff. Decker, Decker's blue collar pro- proletariat professional gentleman playwright. Like maybe not even gentleman, just professional playwright. Like, um, but apparently he's writing some pamphlets, uh, doing this sort of Thomas Nash thing. Uh, we'll see what that's about. And uh, you know maybe specifically when he's in prison, he's writing these pamphlets. Maybe to make up some money to get him out of, like, I don't know, what if he just pays the 40 pounds? Can he just get out of, I don't know, is that too much money back then? I don't know. Um, this is fun. I have many of these charts, not just for Thomas Decker, but uh, for Thomas Decker, I had to make this font real small, so we have to zoom in pretty good to read all these. That's why I'm zoomed in so far. Other, other people, I could zoom out, maybe show the whole chart, but Thomas Decker has so many plays. Uh, many of which we don't have anymore. Like, we, we referenced uh, this one, Black Batman, uh, in a previous video. Um, there's some of these that, uh, you know, may have famous titles, uh, or just have titles of famous people. Uh, this one, I want to give a shout-out to Chance Medley, uh, me being Chance. Because, um, you know, also, some pretty cool names in it, too. Shout-out to the uh, Conan, Prince yeah. of Cornwall. Yeah, Brady's a big uh, Conan the Barbarian uh, fan, uh, Who's, who's that? Uh, Robert? Robert e. Howard. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, here we go. Troilus and Cressida. Uh, Lust Dominion or the Spanish Morse Tragedy. Uh, and those could be two different plays, by the way. Um, this is one that could be the original version of Othello. Um, but then, is yeah. Is that a character from someone? Uh, Fortunatus is an older play that Decker reworks, although the original could be by Decker. The original could be by Green, because Robert Green's son is supposed to be named Fortunatus, although... Uh, it's not, what a mean name <laughs> like <laughs> what a mean thing to name don't don't do that out there but like don't if you're about to have a kid don't put fortunato or fortunatus on the list um if fortunato isn't isn't that the edgar Allan poe character from that's what i'm thinking of from yeah. a cask of Amontillado. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking yeah of. also don't yeah, <laughs> yeah don't use that name like yeah to reiterate <laughs> All right, uh, Shoemaker's Holiday referenced that in uh, our essential readings. That's uh, a Decker one that's super heavily printed. And this gives you a perfect idea because it's not with anybody else. It's supposed to be just Decker. It gives you a perfect idea of what you're looking for when you're looking for Decker style. Uh, it's this real quick jib-jab between characters that's real fast-paced and funny and witty. Um, you get characters doing a lot of accents and dialects and uh, using real colloquial language. Uh, not a lot of highfalutin words, but when there are highfalutin words, they're almost, you know, silly and made up, and they're not words that we would use these days, but they're, like, overly Latin-y. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's a bunch of other ones. Satiro Mastix, I referenced this with the uh, War of the Theaters. Uh, we'll come back to that, maybe. Um, let's see. Here's some that you can read. These uh, later ones, they do start to get published and printed, so... You can definitely read Westward Ho, and you can read Satira Mystics as well. Um, you can read Northward Ho, which, uh, yeah, read these two in conjunction with Eastward Ho, and, um, yeah, you can maybe start to make heads or tails of another little miniature rebuttal of the War of the Theaters. Um, let's see. Uh, the Nobles. No, no. Is that like an Othello shout out, maybe? Uh, this could be similar to the Spanish Moorish tragedy, or this could be a different one. It could be influenced just by the research done for the other one. Uh, there could be a relationship. Uh, I wish to God I could get a copy of Jephthah, because uh, I don't know if that's the Jephthah from uh, the Old Testament, but that's like one of my favorite 
characters in the Old Testament. Uh, it's it's like a, a Job story. It's a, it's a lot shorter than the Job story, but uh, it's a guy that you know sort of tested by God, and makes a deal with God, and it's a, I don't know, it's it's pretty great and ironic and dark, and uh, I'd be interested in seeing what Decker's take is on that. Uh, but yeah, you can read Lady Jane, you can read Sir Thomas Wyatt, and these are pretty good history plays, and they read a lot like, you know, some, some of the Shakespeare history plays. Uh, uh, maybe most closely to, say, like, King John, maybe? Um, but not just that, like any of the history plays, honestly. Um, maybe not quite Richard II, you know. Um, maybe not even quite Richard III, but the, yeah, the rest of them. Uh, let's see. And yeah, we, we get them writing with a bunch of folks. We Writing with Middleton, writing with Webster, writing with Middleton, writing with Webster, writing with Monday, writing with Drayton. Uh, and then later he's writing with Ford. He's writing with Massinger. So he's writing with the next generation. So he's, you know, Decker's huge and nobody talks about Decker and that bothers me and I don't really quite understand it. Um, but to like put it all into perspective and see like really who is Thomas Decker and like you know, we've got them all over the Henslow Diary. Here we have them getting paid for writing the whole history of Fortunatus, which is this is what becomes old Fortunatus that we just saw on that list. And like we mentioned in the Henslow video, Troilus and Cressida, for instance, which has the exact same name as a Shakespeare play, that one is now considered lost, and so we can't be like, oh, can we go compare the two? Let's see what was really borrowed or not. Or uh, Nope, there's no way for us to... Uh, be able to actually properly compare those two. Absolutely. And like, um, you know, one of the first things that got me onto Thomas Decker was uh, I teach Macbeth, and so I have to read Macbeth a lot. And uh, after I started reading some Decker, I started wondering, like, wait, there's some stuff in Macbeth that reminds me of Decker. And then kind of remembered that, like, Decker writes a lot of witch plays. And so, you know. The witch of Edmonton was the other one that was listed yeah, in there. Yeah, uh, Witch of Edmonton. Um, and. I want to say there's yet another one, but uh, um, it's like an earlier version of Witch of Edmonton, maybe. Um, but yeah, so let me go into um, some John Stotzenberg, who we say is like maybe the most important person to start reading to think about group theory. He talks about Decker, you know, at length in his book, The Impartial Study of the Shakespeare Title. And he does some uh, close readings of Troilus and Cressida, The Taming of the Shrew. And um, um, let's see. It says, I cannot give adhesion to the view expressed by Webb and other gifted writers that Bacon wrote Troilus and Cressida. And uh, to be fair, John Stotzenberg is kind of a Baconian. Like, he wants to find Bacon, and he can't quite find him. So who is he finding? He says, it was, in my opinion, based upon the foregoing facts, originally the production of Decker and Chettle, that we see in the Henslow Diary, added to and philosophically dressed by Francis Bacon. So when it's getting printed later, or getting put on as a Shakespeare, that's Bacon's dressed up version of what Decker and Chettle did. Um, I don't know how much I want to go down the Bacon line of thought, because um, I've read from you know Stephanie Hopkins Hughes that Thomas Decker is Francis Bacon. And so that means he's getting like a double dose of bacon here. And I don't know really quite what to make of that. But partly what's happening here is that John Stotzenberg is assuming that Thomas Decker is very separate from Francis Bacon. And so when he sees stuff that looks directly like a line from Decker, he's not looking further to see, is that also from bacon? He just, oh, that's Decker. Boom, give it to Decker. That means it's not bacon. Um, and so that may be a little bit of bad logic on his part if bacon is Decker, but... I'm, we're not going to go on down that today. Um, but let me see. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me go back a page or two. And so he says, uh, words used in Troilus and Cressida and only once in the play and also used by Decker are as follows. Blackamoor, brainless, inveigled, lifter, mealy, plaguey, unclasped, wafted, winching. And so this is a technique that he does is he finds words that are rare usage and that's people still do that in you know computer style metric uh data analysis today is that's how you can maybe find style is find words that are super rare that are only used in certain plays and only used a certain amount of times and so it's like these are rare words that we see throughout decker and we're seeing them in this play only once and you're not going to see them necessarily in other plays um 
So that's a good argument that, like, if that's not Decker, then this is super influenced by Decker, or this is being reworked from Decker or something like that. When Troilus says, do not give advantage to stubborn critics, Decker in Knight's Conjuring says, take heed of critics. When Pandarus says, and I have a room in my eyes, too, Decker, um, I'm not sure exactly which one this is, um, says, I am troubled with a horse and salt room. Um, Neither Bacon nor Drayton, nor indeed any dramatic poet of the time save the creator Simon Neary and Orlando Friscobaldo could have written in Troilus and Cressetta the following. And I think this is where his argument really, you know, it's not a direct parallel passage. This is super impressionistic. But seriously, who else could have written these lines? Now the rotten diseases of the South, the guts griping ruptures, the catars, loads of gravel in the back, lethargies, cold palsies, raw eyes, Dirt and rotten livers, wheezing lungs, bladders full of imposthume, shikticas, lime kilns in the palm, incurable bone ache, and the riveled fee simple of the tetter. Take and take again such preposterous discoveries. Or the following. Thou damnable box of envy, you ruinous butt, you horse and indistinguishable cur, thou idle immaterial skein of slayed silk, thou green sarcenet flat for a sore eye, thou tassel of a prodigal's purse, thou... So, um... When I said, uh, who else could write these lines, I think there's only a few names that could possibly even be thrown into the ring. Um, immediately, I, we, you know, you people think Shakespeare is somebody that's separate from Thomas Decker. You're, oh, Shakespeare could. Um, but I'm going to say that, no, let's not count Shakespeare for now because we think Thomas Decker is Shakespeare. Um, who else? Um, maybe Ben Johnson? But even Ben would be a little prettier and a little more structured about it. This is, you know, this is just kind of spewing. And uh, so spewing, maybe John Marston. But John Marston would be clunkier about it. Uh, there's something very poetic about thou idle immaterial skein of slayed silk. Getting the assonance with the I's, then getting the consonants and alliteration with the S and uh, the K's, like, that's just really great poetic use of, uh, you know, sound and, and um, you don't get that always in Marston. Um, so it seems to me that this most looks like Decker, but wait, there's another name. There's another name I'm forgetting. And there's a, maybe a better name th than Decker. And that's Thomas Nash. If you've read any Thomas Nash, especially Pierce Penniless or uh, uh, any of any of his stuff with the, the devil or the seven sins, uh, any of that stuff, all of it reads like that. All of it reads exactly like that. And so maybe this isn't Thomas Decker and this is Thomas Nash. But, uh, spoiler alert, maybe Nash is Decker. Um, this is Donna Murphy, and she was our number two on our Essential Readings author. Uh, she's most famous for the Marlowe Shakespeare Continuum, but even in the Marlowe Shakespeare Continuum, which we only have a snippet here from, like, a uh, Cambridge scholars, we don't have the full book, but we can kind of look at the start. And she compares some older plays with Shakespeare, and then she starts comparing some Marlowe with Shakespeare and uh, Kid with Shakespeare. And um, when she's doing that, she's also comparing Nash, because we say that Nash helped co write Dido with Marlowe. And that Nash may have helped co-write Jew of Malta or even uh, Dr. Faustus. And so when she's doing this Shakespeare continuum, it's not just Marlowe. Uh, Ross Barber, if you're watching, or Bash and Conrad, if you're watching, or any Marlovians out there, know that it's not just Marlowe that's part of this continuum. It's Thomas Nash as well. Um, but she goes further. She has another book that we only have a snippet of here. And she says, there's a connection between these two. And it, uh, spoiler, not just a connection. She's going to tell you they're the same person. Um, but she's doing it very similarly as Stotzenberg making parallel passage readings. But she has computers on her side that Stotzenberg just doesn't. So when you see it in Stotzenberg, it's super impressive. But it may be very prone to inaccuracy or mistake. Uh, so just grain of salt when you're reading Stotzenberg. He is doing that in 1904. They don't have computers. Um, but in this, she just compares over and over Thomas Nash and Thomas Decker. And so I'll give you a, a snippet of her, of her opening. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it, it probably is a duck. Uh, you've heard that 
a lot. And, you know, that can be prone to being wrong. Uh, logic isn't always like that. Um, but it's common sense, and it's a good jumping-off point to start testing your logic. And so Thomas Decker, you know, looks like Thomas Nash, swims like Thomas Nash, quacks like Thomas Nash, probably is Thomas Nash. It would be better if Thomas Nash swims like a Decker. Uh, yeah, yeah. Quacks like a Decker. <laughs> Uh, yeah, quacks like a deck, you know. Uh, <clears throat> uh, could English Renaissance author Thomas Nash have tricked contemporaries into thinking he had died, yet continue living as Thomas Decker and tricked the rest of us for 400 years? Uh, of course, me and Brady say absolutely. Like, uh, don't even ask a silly question next. Um, and then uh, she says, I will maintain that Nash carried off the ruse by publishing material not only as Thomas Decker, but over the course of Decker's prolific writing career, also as TM, Adam Eavesdropper, Joe Cundry, Mary Brains, Jack Daw, and Anonymous, making it appear that various men could write like Nash. Uh, so, Bashan, if you're watching, here's multiple pseudonym, pseudonym, multiple pseudonym theory. I'll just, uh, pseudonym, pseudonymity, there we go. Multiple pseudonymity theory. Um, so, you're, you're not the only one out there. Hers is just maybe a little more limited. It's not every writer of the Renaissance era. It's just these names, but... It's very possible that we have writers using multiple pseudonyms. Our group theory assumes multiple pseudonymity. Um, it's just a collective group of people using each using multiple pseudonyms rather than one person using all those pseudonyms, which is, you know, logistically humanly impossible. Explain to me how Christopher Marlowe is writing all these hundreds or thousands of pamphlets, poems, plays getting paper for them, uh, eating, showering, grooming, buying clothes, uh, you know, going to the bathroom. How, how is he doing all this? Like, the only way that's possible is, like, if he lives in some horrible William Gibson, like, dystopia where he has all these wires and he's just, like, beaming out, you know, like, uh, you know, if, if you're saying that, maybe. Um, but no, this is a much more realistic version of what a multiple pseudonymity theory would look like. We'd give a handful of names over decades. Um, so I'm going to skip over to yet another essay by Donna Murphy that's a shorter version of this book that's a little more direct and we get the full thing, so we're just going to scroll through this rather than her full book. But uh, it's basically the basis of her book. So she says, the curious connection between Nash, Decker, and not just Nash and Decker, but what's this? Freemasonry. Ah, now we get to the crux of things. Uh, and Yeah, crux, like the rosy crux, the Rosicrucians, same guys. Um, we say Freemasons, uh, kids on TikTok say Illuminati, uh, you Baconians say Rosicrucians. We're talking about the same folks, the same network of intelligentsia across Europe that are interwoven with different uh, religious sects, interwoven with different, uh, you know, political spheres and... Uh, geopolitical kingdoms, uh, nation states, um, that is cropping up visibly for the first time in the 15 and 1600s and is going public in the 16 and 1700s. Um, so let's see. In the autumn of 1597, Nash was in trouble again. We saw this in Mires, right? Uh, Nash escaped Great Yarmouth, where he spent six weeks, according to Linton stuff, and Francis Mires reported that Nash was still banished in 1598. Well, just as Nash took to the wings, a new author sallied forth who wrote as if he were channeling Nash. And this is an excellent point. We need to start looking at dates uh, because dates are starting to match up really well. That's one of the things that led Brady and I to our Sidney Daniel connection was that Sidney's gone in 86. Daniel pops up on the scene in 86. Nash disappears in 98. Decker pops on the scene in 98. Okay, I already have some connection here. Maybe there's more to it. He first appears as Dickers in Henslow's Diary. Um, let's see. In Henslow's Diary, Decker hit the ground running, authoring or co-authoring over 40 plays. So if this is just some new guy on the scene, he is immediately given keys to the, you know, the Lamborghini and told, you know, drive as fast as you want. That's kind of crazy. Some, some no-name guy that maybe from the Netherlands, uh, don't know anything about his family or history, like, not even that old, still in his 20s at this point, and it's like, all right, you're, you're the main guy, you're going to write every play. 
what the heck? How does that happen? Who is that? That doesn't make any sense. Garbage. Nonsense. Uh, these are lies. Lies from the wolf. Um, let's see. It includes 15 with Nash's friend Henry Chettle. So Henry Chettle is sort of a link. He's one of our few links between the earlier University Wits era and the later uh, Henslow Diary era. Uh, the University Wits seem to be almost isolated and it's almost like they exactly die when these Henslow Diary characters come onto the scene. And maybe that makes sense. They die and you need to refilm with somebody. But it's almost convenient that they all die like in the same set of years between 92 and 95. And then all these guys pop up on the scene right after that. The only one that's on the scene for both of them, well, uh, Monday is for sure, but Monday's super spy extraordinaire, so don't trust anything from Monday. But Henry Chettle is sort of on the scene and supposed to be buddies with Robert Green, and maybe Henry Chettle's the one that really writes Green Grotzwert's wit and other stuff of Robert Green, and if that's the case, that's really interesting that he's the one that wrote the Upstart Crow, um, not Robert Green. Um, but at some point, I think they're both pen names, and it's going to be the same sort of concealed aristocratic poet writer either way. And so we need to start asking who that is. But I've mentioned in other videos before, when you're reading Tamberlane, you're getting the really bombastic da 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 That's Robert Greene slash Henry Chettle. So it's not just Marlowe that's writing those lines. Um, in Troilus and Cressida, that's by Decker and Chettle in Webster. Um, that is... Memnon? Agamemnon, thank you. Agamemnon. Anytime you're reading Agamemnon, for the most part, probably Chettle. Um, excellent just basis to get a stylistic uh, idea of how he writes. And uh, go check out Patient Grizzle. Uh, can do po uh, comedy too, but I think it works real well with these sort of adventurous tragedies. Um, so let's see. Um, here's some stuff about three girls were christened at St. Giles. Uh, their foster father listed as Thomas Dicker, Dickers, and Dicker. Uh, people generally accept these were Dicker's children since the name is uncommon. But no evidence exists to support this. Decker never wrote about them, so same way that Shakespeare doesn't really talk about his kids, other than you folks that think Hamlet's about his kid Hamnet. It's not. That's stupid. Um, same thing here. Decker isn't writing about his kids. We get a bunch of stories of city life, a bunch of stories of historical characters. Almost never is it talking about three daughters, unless, unless you're saying <laughs> he wrote King Lear. Uh, which, you know, uh, that one doesn't immediately jump out of super Deckerian, except for, I don't know, the way Lear talks is kind of Deckerian, and uh, the way that uh, Lear's fool talks is kind of Deckerian, and I don't know, even the way that the fool kind of disappears is kind of Deckerian, so uh, I don't know, maybe there's something to that. Um, let's see, indeed, few details about Thomas Decker's life have been discovered, and this is a really interesting point for me. Alexander Grossart, who's big, big-time scholar of Elizabethan literature, if you ever read a compilation or a compendium of uh, uh, any famous poet or playwright's works from that era, it was probably originally compiled by Alexander Grossart. Uh, and uh, Alexander Grossart doesn't just compile them, does all sorts of research to give you these long, thorough introductions. And so uh, a lot of these playwrights, including Shakespeare, he digs up a lot of stuff that makes us say, hmm, Maybe this is a person. Maybe this is a front man. Maybe this is... Decker, we don't even have that. There's not even enough to say, ah, Decker's some front man using... No. Decker's, like, not even a person. It's just a name. And even Alexander Grossart says, uh, Decker, that his indefatigable energy of research was probably never exercised so, to so little purpose in the case of any author. So, it's almost like it was a waste of time trying to search for Decker. Um... On subject of his birth and age, all scholars have to go on is what was he wrote uh, in a passage in 1632, English Villainies. He speaks of my three scores of years. People take that literally and say, ah, born in 72. But, uh, you know, if he's really Thomas Nash, Nash was born in 67, so it would be three score and five years. So it's like, you know, just saying 60-ish years old. I'm 60-something years old, you know. Um, let's see. do 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 no one knows anything about his schooling, but clearly educated um, in a lot, including Latin and Greek. Um, 
But let's go back to Nash. What about Nash? He does pop up one more time with Linton stuff in 99. Uh, and he says, I'm called away to correct the faults of the press that escaped in my absence from the printing house. And he says, in my exile and irksome discontent abandonment, the silliest Miller's thumb and contemptible stickle bank of my enemies is a busy nibbling about my fame as if I were a dead man thrown amongst them to feed upon. Um, and I'll keep going. But it's like Nash 2 to me seems like copy. Um, Donna doesn't ever go that far. Donna thinks Thomas Nash is Thomas Nash. I don't think that, that is the case. Um, Thomas Nash seems to me is much copy and a fake person as Thomas Decker. Though, if we go to Thomas Decker, we get like, we, little is known. We, we don't know. But if we go to Thomas Nash, we do have a bunch of stuff. That said, <clears throat> what I think is happening with Thomas Nash, he's one of our earliest frontmen. Um, and one of the reasons I believe that is because we have here that around 1581, he went up to St. John's College, Cambridge, uh, same as Marlowe, uh, as a sizer, uh, which Green was a sizer, Marlowe was a type of sizer. I uh, can't remember if Kid is, but almost all these guys are. Uh, Peel, maybe. What's a sizer? If you've never heard this term, a sizer is an undergraduate who receives some form of assistance such as meals, lower fees, lodging during his period of study, in some cases in return for doing it a fine job. Basically, it was like a scholarship that some third party or even the university would pay for a poor but maybe talented kid to come to the university. But that, that kid would have to do all sorts of menial, horrible labor and would usually end up getting bullied. And uh, there's you know, literature about being a sizer that suggests it sucked. Um, so maybe that's what makes Nash so angry. But my personal opinion is that anytime you see a sizer, that's one of these aristocratic concealed poets saying hey, let's, or maybe even Walsingham saying, hey, let's get this guy a scholarship and now we can use him as a spy and return, you know, the payments, getting the scholarship and then getting to go maybe work your way up to gentleman status or something higher. Um, and all they got to do is maybe do a little spy work and let their name be used on publications. Pretty good deal, right? <clears throat> um, so let me go back and scroll further. She talks a lot about Decker taking up Nash's banner. Um, Decker writes pretty much about the same kind of stuff. Writes about the seven deadly sins. Uh, when it comes to satire, Nash had a gift for seeing and depicting the ridiculous in human behavior. Of course, so does Decker. Um, and he totally satires almost everything, parodies everything he can. Decker wrote News from Hell, which was the devil's answer to uh, Pierce Penniless, which is you know Nash's like maybe most famous work. In perfect Nash speak, eulogizing Nash, I think exactly as the poet would have wished. And thou Nash, into whose soul if there was ever a Pythagorean metempsychosis, the raptures, which, yeah, this this isn't some poor kid from the streets. <laughs> the raptures of that fiery and inconfidable Italian spirit were boundless and boundlessly infused. Thou sometimes secretary to Pierce Penniless and master of his request, ingenious, ingenuous, fluent, facetious Thomas Nash, from whose abundant pen honey flowed to thy friends, which... Or that honey, Lipless, yeah. honey flowing, yep. Uh, and mortal aconite to thy enemies. Uh, thou that madest Dr. Harvey a flat dunce and beatest him to two tall sundry weapons, poetry and oratory, sharp as satire, luculent poet. Elegant orator, get leave for thy ghost to come from her abiding and to dwell with me a little while till she hath caroused me to me in her own wanted full measures of wit that my plump brains may swell and burst into bitter invectives against the lieutenant of Limbo if he ca uh, cashier Pierce Penniless with dead pay. Yeah, only Nash could write that, but Decker wrote that. They gotta be the same guy. Um, in the revised edition of this book, A Knight's Conjuring, Decker placed Nash in Elysian Grove of Bay Trees along with other deceased poets he wished to honor. Um, she doesn't have that full section in here, but if you do read that section, that section is interesting because it talks about a bunch of poets, and uh, it's one that kind of makes fun of Thomas Kidd. It says he's left out to dry. Don't know what that means. Uh, maybe not those exact terms, but that was the basic gist of it. Um, and it says, Indeed, in Old Fortunatus, an anonymous play written at least in part by Decker, we hear, My tongue speaks no language, but an almond for a parrot and crack me this nut. Um, that's Thomas Nash's stuff. Um, so even if Decker's not Nash, super influenced by Nash, right? 
Uh, moreover, in Decker's Bellman in London, the speech praising beggars evokes another same subject. Uh, in Summer's Last Will and Testament, it ends with Peace cries the penniless orator. Decker took a Nash like stand of defiance and punningly compared being a writer to being pressed to death. Um, further stretching coincidence, Decker parodied the interests of Nash's enemies, Gabriel, Richard, and John Harvey, sons of a rope maker. The title pamphlet quoted above is a play on Harvey's Gorgon or The Wonderful Year, while Decker's O Perseo is a takeoff on a Harvey nickname for Nash, A Persea, uh, which I wonder if that's a play on the name Percy. You know, we have Henry Percy, who's uh, Earl of uh, Northumberland, uh, so maybe, I don't know. I do, I do try to uh, see Percy uh, puns, because uh, I do want to find Henry Percy in Shakespeare. He's called the Wizard Earl. Like, I definitely want to find Wizard <laughs> Earl in Shakespeare. Uh, also, Henry Percy is born the same year as Shakespeare, so it matches up really well. Also, Henry Percy is, like, maybe one of the richest men in England, but I don't know that this is it all have to do with Henry Percy, but just saying. Um, let's see. A Nashian portion of Dr. Faustus when Robin the Cloud reads a Persea, the T-H, the, the, oh, Perseo, deny organ, Gorgon? Decker's Lanthorn Candlelight contains a story about a rope maker called Richard, who was a parlous, sour fellow, ill-loved of his neighbors. Gabriel and John wrote almanacs, and Decker's The Raven's Almanac is a send-up of the genre. In Decker's Satiro Matrix, Mastix, a character says, Recipis funim, think on the rope's end. The same pun as Recipis finim, think on your end. Um, that Nash jabbed Harvey with in Strange News, which is also included in this. So, like... These are like puns on puns on puns that are super deep cut from old, you know, literature. At some point, this isn't just Decker like being topical. If Decker's not Nash, then Decker's like obsessed with Nash. Nobody other than Nash could drop those lines or would even want to. Why would you want to so late? Like that that that's over a ten year old, twenty year old like, you know, uh, argument. Who cares? Why do you still make fun of Gabriel Harvey? Unless, like, you were just really good at it, and that's what you did. What is the main difference between Decker and Nash? See, that's a good question. Um, Penry maintained that it was one of personality. Quote, Decker is far less egotistic, far less arrogant. While Nash craves personal recognition, Decker would be satisfied with peace and quiet. You know, um, to Murphy, that makes tons of sense, because Nash was loud and then got banished and then now has to you know, live a little under the radar, so can still do all these things, but not quite so hard. Um, I would go, like, one step further and say that, well, the the big difference here is that, like, Decker's writing plays and Nash is mostly writing pamphlets, and those pamphlets are happening kind of at the start of all that pamphlet making, and uh, that was sort of Nash's stick was to be really biting, but if you do that in a play, good luck getting people to watch your play. Like, people are gonna be throwing tomatoes and stuff. So you, you have to tone it down a little bit. You gotta bring the whole family in at some point. Um, so let's see. Uh, yet Decker became involved in a literary battle, too. So it wasn't just Nash versus the Harveys. Later on, we get Decker and Marston versus Ben Johnson. It almost sort of mirrors it, and maybe we'll bring that up in later videos, because to me, I keep going back, what is the ultimate feud? And, like, it keeps seeming to me that all this mirrors Sydney Circle versus the Oxford Circle. And uh, maybe we have something there. Maybe if we take those and try to allegorically transpose them onto any of these literary conflicts that are happening in the 1590s or even 1600s, may be able to make sense of them, but not going to do that here. Um, let's see. And so, even so, Decker's self-description is one who is condemned with his cattle to be ducked three times in the cucking stool of peripheral phlegaton because he scolded against his betters and those whom he lived upon. Sounds odd, since Johnson would not have been considered his superior. Um, unless Ben Johnson's not Ben Johnson and Thomas Decker's not Thomas Decker, then that's totally possible. Especially, say, if Ben Johnson, and I don't think this, but... What if Ben Johnson's Oxford? What if we've got this all wrong? And ben Johnson's Oxford instead of Shakespeare. And say, Edward Dyer is Thomas Decker. Well, Oxford does have higher rank than Thomas, or than uh, Edward Dyer. And so if Thomas Decker is censuring Ben Johnson, that means Edward Dyer would be censuring Oxford. That would be somebody censuring their better. So um, 
something like that I think is happening. Uh, the names that I put there, I don't know that that was accurate whatsoever. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. And that's why she thinks it's Thomas Nash, because Thomas Nash um, uh, has also been accused of censuring his betters when he's censuring Harvey. So is it possible that Nash changed his appearance and uh, became Thomas Decker after like faking his death? Um, how could that happen? How in the world could that possibly happen? Um, well, like... There's a lot, a lot of evidence, first of all, to show that those are the same people. We get memorial associations, shared rare usage words, matches between words and phrases, similarities of style and content, and just other countless similarities. Uh, but how would that happen? Like, clearly these have to be the same guys, but how would that happen? Well, this kind of goes into uh, what Brady and I have yet to sort of fully prove or fully understand or fully conclude on is, how's that happening with Philip Sidney and Samuel Daniel? Um, ultimately, it seems to be wrapped up in this whole Rosicrucian or proto-Rosicrucian, proto-Masonic movement. Uh, this whole Sydney D circle, this Ariel Pages circle that's connected with Walsingham, that's connected with Cecil, um, that's connected with Dudley. All these people that are pulling the strings of England that aren't named Elizabeth, maybe Elizabeth too, but that aren't named Elizabeth, um, that's the ones that are capable of doing this kind of stuff. Um, and so she wants to figure out, like, you know, what does Freemasonry have to do with it? And by the way, you know, Freemasonry is not supposed to be around until the 1700s, you know, not 1590s or 1600s when Decker and Shakespeare and Nash are writing. Um, and so we get Freemasonry went public in 1717. The first two known Freemasons, Robert Moray and Elias Ashmole. And uh, Brady's going to have more on that in a future video. That's the one we referenced in our last video. That'll be the big mic drop. Uh, this one, you know, we hope is kind of a mic drop, but this is not the big mic drop video that we're coming to you with. Uh, that one will be in the future, and we'll get into some of this crazy yeah. John D. The thumbnail itself will just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do, 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 yeah, like get the chills. Like D, D's, you know, uh, Monus hi hi Hieroglyphica sort of thing where you just, uh, you know. It's going to be the thumbnail being coded with all sorts of that stuff, so have at it, you know. <laughs> uh, if you guys have ever seen The Shining, like Danny in front of the, the girls or, or the elevator, just, uh, you know, that's, that'll be all after that video. Um, so, yeah, the hype train is rolling. But until then, let's uh, dive back into Decker and Freemasonry. So uh, these two guys joined in 1641 and 1646, respectively. Both were founding members of the Royal Society. But it was not a new organization at the time. So even though uh, these guys are the first two documented, it's not new. It's, you know, there, there were others in it for them to join. Um, and so our official history is published in 1723 with Anderson's Constitution. Shout out to Anderson and Savannah. <laughs> Unhelpfully claimed that Adam was the first Freemason. Adam? Who's Adam? Uh, like Adam Smith? Uh, Adam... Adam Westchester, Adam, Adam, well, who's Adam? No, the Adam, like a Adam of, of Earth, Adam Genesis Adam, you know, the first guy ever in the Bible Adam. So uh, already off the scientific and historical rails, but what, why would that be happening? Well, it's interesting because everything that we're seeing in all these poetry is trying to link stuff back to Latin and Greek, this sort of pagan type thing, but this is linking it back to, you know, orthodox sort of Christian ideas, biblical ideas, which, you know, to be fair, are totally pagan in their own right, but, like, um, it's trying to link it back to the oldest thing it possibly can, and that's, you know, as, as old as Rome and Greece are, they don't predate the, the Bible with any, you know, the known literature, and so that's them trying to say, look, We've been around as long as time immemorial. Um, and so Adam's sons formed the first Masonic Lodge. Joseph, Moses, and Solomon were all Grand Masters. Um, so, like, this is saying this is a continuation of the people that made all the literary, religious, mythological, society-forming ideas. We're the people that built society, basically. Some think the organization began with the operative 
English stonemasons in transition to a speculative craft. Um, so she's saying, like, you know, stonemasons in the 14 or 1500s, you know, started making these uh, membership groups, and then the membership groups slowly evolved into these ritualistic type craft rites. But um, it's hard to believe because, as she says, uh, it's difficult to take seriously the notion that tradesmen devised a system as sublime as Freemasonry and successfully rooted it among all the intellectuals and the nobility. Um, its philosophical bent evidence is the fingerprints of highly educated people who possess both conviction and free time. Um, so this can't be just like some broke people coming up with these things and then all and then rich people join later. No, it's the other way around. This is rich people, elite people, highly educated people, powerful people making these ideas and that that slowly trickles down to this watered down version that tradesmen start to get around that time. Um, and so it's like, it, it's Reaganomics, right? It's, it's trickle down. Uh, it's not trickle up. Um, and so what's the next sentence though? And this is kind of this little bit of the hype chain microphone drop here. She views Freemasonry as an outgrowth of the circle of men centered around Philip Sidney. What? Freemasonry starts with Philip Sidney? Um, I don't want you to discount Donna Murphy for that statement because I don't think it's so ridiculous. And you're going to see that in our hype train video. Just, just you wait. Just you wait. Um, because Philip Sidney, as we've been trying to point out, is maybe the most important influential character in this whole Elizabethan scene, especially the late Elizabethan scene, 70s onwards. And we'll say past 86. We will both say that. Um, at this point, we will both say that. Uh, intriguing language appears in a funeral elegy, which shout out to Bastion, you got a video on this. A 1612 tribute to the late Master William Peter by W.S., which could be, uh, you know, Wentworth Smith, could be William Smith, could be William Shakespeare. That was formerly thought to be Shakespeare, but is now attributed to John Ford. Hold on, guys. Um, I know I do some deep, deep data analysis here, but let me, let me do some real deep stuff here. I'm going to tell you right now, John does not start with a W. Ford does not start with an S. Uh, so it's interesting that we get to sort of pick and choose when the stuff on the title page is true and when it's not. Because, you know, there are plenty of other plays that we only have WS on that, yeah, that's Shakespeare, put it in. WS, Shakespeare, put it in. Uh, other poems, WS, put it in. W. Shakespeare, put it in. But this one, it's not even, not William Shakespeare. It's not Wentworth Smith. It's not any of them. It's John Ford. And they do it based on stylistic grounds. And so why is it totally unfair for us Shakespeare doubters to say we don't have stylistic evidence from Shakespeare to, to really look at, but we do have stylistic evidence from all these other writers and we can see them all over Shakespeare. Why, why are we able to say this is John Ford, but we're not able to say Troilus and Cressida is Decker and Chettle? What the heck? Not fair. Um, Ken is for the first degree of masonry. Or sorry, oh, let me read some of the lines from a funeral elegy from John Ford. Which, you know, granted, this is not Decker. This is not Shakespeare. This is John Ford. But John Ford's so connected with all these characters. And if you're Bastion Conrad, do you think John Ford is the same person? Um, I don't think John Ford is the same exact person. I think John Ford's probably William Herbert. Um, or maybe even Mary Roth, or maybe both of them, or maybe Philip Herbert. Uh, it's one of them. Um, maybe Mary Sidney, too. Maybe Philip, uh, maybe. Um, but uh, John Ford says, The willful blindness that hoodwinks the eyes of men enwrapped in an earthly veil makes them most ignorantly exercise and yield to humor when it doth the sail. Nice poetry. Candidates for the first degree of masonry are hoodwinked or blindfolded, representing the darkness and ignorance which does not comprehend the light, as well as the mystical darkness which precedes the rite of ancient initiations. Symbols related to temple building, both within oneself and without, are key to the organization. So, like, this is very direct, deliberate Masonic language. This isn't just a, a coincidence. This is deliberate. It's following a ritualistic rite. Elegy maintains that learning wit enriched the curious temple of his, Peter, uh, William Peter, but maybe also Peter, Peter, like, you know, first, first Pope, 
Peter, Jesus' buddy Peter, um, shuns the glad slates of ensnaring vice to spend his spring days in sacred schools. Sacred schools. Here gave he diet to the sick desires that day by day assault the weaker man, and with fit moderation still retires from what doth better virtue now and then. A sacred school wherein one gives diet to sick desires that assault the weaker man is apt description for Masonic Lodge. So, you know, got some ascetic beliefs, um, got some sort of mental discipline, some spiritual training going on here. Uh, the author certainly was not talking about Protestant or Catholic churches. No, this is a sacred school. You don't talk about church as a school. A mystery school. Yeah, this is, this is something deeper. This is something a little more esoteric, a little more occult. The language suggests that two university-trained men one of whom was a poet playwright, were involved in the organization as of 1612. That Nash himself was a member is hinted at when he maintains that science hath no enemy but the ignorant, and rails against those who endeavor to turn our day into night and our light into darkness. And by the fact that post Tenebras dies, appears on the cover of Terrors of Night. Um, let's see. From ignorance to knowledge is a motto every, uh, very commonly used in the caption of Masonic documents as expressive of the object of masonry and what the true mason supposes himself to have obtained. And this is like all really old hermetic stuff, right? This isn't like a totally new thing. It's just clearly this movement's being codified, gaining momentum. Uh, it's, Order from chaos, literally, right? Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, like literally going public with this stuff. Maybe not fully public, but... It's now being seen. Um, for his part, Decker wrote, The fountains of science flow and swell to the brim. Bay trees make garlands for learning. Our new set and already are green. The muses have fresh colors in their cheeks. Their temple is promised to be made more fair. There is good hope that ignorance shall no longer wear satin. I think that Nash belonged to a community of Masonic authors who vowed to keep his secret. who would have been viewed in, as a fellow advocate in advancing the enrichment of English language. And this goes back to what me and Brady talk about with empire. Um, the English language needed to supersede Latin. It needed to become the language of empire. Not just of England, but of empire. So that it could spread and take over the world. And um, it was competing with Spanish. And let's be honest, what have we seen? What have we seen in this world? The entire Western Hemisphere speaks two languages, Spanish or English. And... Um, not just the Western Hemisphere, right? Like, people are speaking Spanish what, in the Philippines. People are speaking English, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. And, of course, at this point, people speak English all over the freaking world. Um, and it's because of these guys. It's because of this project. It's because of this very deliberate effort. And it's, at some point, it's not just Shakespeare trying to write honey-flowing stuff. These are a group of people that centers around Philip Sidney that is making a very concerted, covert effort to enrich our language so that empire can be built. It's that simple. Um, let's see. She goes on and she um, talks about other works by Fletcher, Shakespeare, and Johnson that can connect to uh, Masonic stuff, but we're not going to go too much farther into this. Uh, I just want to give you a sort of brief account that Thomas Decker is indeed the same person as Thomas Nash. Uh, how much farther we can go with that is really up to how much digging we can do. Um, but Brady and I are still trying to figure out where to go from here with these guys. So you folks need to jump in and help us. Go start reading your Decker. Go start reading your Nash. See if you can pinpoint Bacon or Dyer or... Um, Devere or somebody. Um, let's see who Decker is because I don't think it stops at Thomas Nash. I've seen some folks out there say Thomas Nash is Devere. Um, and so if Thomas Nash is Devere and Decker's Devere, um, then maybe we can make heads or tails of this War of the Theaters. And so maybe that means Johnson Sidney. Um, but, and maybe that makes sense that Marston's siding with Decker because Marston maybe is William Stanley. And so, oh, maybe we have something here. Same with the Harveys. Maybe the Harveys are Sydney Circle. Maybe those three brothers are Sydney Greville and Dyer. And maybe Nash and his crowd is Oxford and his crowd. 
Um, that's for you guys to decide. Um, thanks for tuning in on this one. I'm going to turn it over to Brady. We're going to do a little magic flipperoo. Um, let me see, make sure I got all the stuff I want to say. Oh, I do want to give a quick shout out. Um, if you guys haven't been watching the Shakespeare Authorship Roundtable, go check out the Shakespeare Authorship Roundtable. Um, I'm struggling. Okay, here we go. Um, Sabrina Feldman, she's an Oxfordian, but she's not just an Oxfordian. She's a group theorist. And she became a group theorist because there's too many other names that seem to be part of this. Uh, especially Thomas Sackville, that seems to be her thing. But this is like an hour-long thing that came out a, a year or two ago. It's just saying, these are recent discoveries that show us it can't just be Oxford, it can't just be Bacon. Uh, go check out Sabrina Feldman. Go check out this video. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I want you guys to uh, stick around if you can. Brady's got his whole spiel. Uh, it goes kind of into his personal life and what sucked him into this, but it all connects and revolves around Thomas Decker and Thomas Nash because, uh, I don't know if we've mentioned this, Brady's last name is Nash, and uh, Brady's middle name is Thomas. So I won't steal any more of his thunder, but I will let him do that. We're going to do a magic flip. We're going to switch seats, and then we'll be right back with you. All right, and poof, we have completed our magic trick, so we have switched sides, so I will be driving uh, the computer screen now. And I, if you've followed us up until this point of the episode, uh, you are maybe hopefully convinced or at least intrigued by the idea that Thomas Decker is Thomas Nash. And and that's where we're going to sort of, we're going to definitely take that on a... Uh, uh, as uh, yeah, one of our presumptions and also that i mean according to murphy right that there's also a she called it the nash your nash decker marlowe continuum right there's a lot of interplay so just to just to re remind us as moving forward now as we mentioned in our episode five i believe which is the our origins episode one of the things that i or that sort of in, uh yeah caught my attention in with the shakespeare office of question was looking into this Thomas Nash character, I was uh, essentially, like we also talked about in our first episode, where I talk about uh, wanting to be a great author, but I can't be a great author if I can't just, you know, drop Shakespearean lines, uh, you know, uh, at the whip of a hat, uh, you know, at, at command or at, at will, if you, if you, yeah. Yeah, at, uh, yeah, if that you makes are. sense. And so I um, was reading a lot of Macbeth because I liked Macbeth a lot especially the uh, anything to do with the weird sisters and the like. And there was a line that I quoted that was um, the uh, incarnadizing the multitudinous sea. And I became really interested in and uh, began to go ask Chance about it. And when I got over to his house, I didn't know to copy yet. Uh, and he was deep into his Shakespeare sort of research at the time and was pointing out, you know, at the beginning of the book, my little, um, it's the... Uh, the, I, I forget, it's the Signet Classics is the one he gave me. And at the beginning of the book, it has stuff about Robert Greene, the Epstar Crow, and it has all a bunch of Shakespeare authorship stuff in, in just these mainstream books, essentially. And so I went home that day and, you know, looked up, you know, Robert Greene, Shakespeare, just to see what I'd find. And lo and behold, this is the first thing that kind of popped up, uh, or at least that caught my eye. And it catches my eye because, as I described in episode five, is that my last name is Nash. But my middle name is also Thomas. And so I was very, you know, I was, you know, very, uh, thought that was quite humorous. And so, yeah, I definitely looked into it a little further. And uh, just to kind of show y'all on the computer screen here, you've actually been watching, you know, three Thomas Nashes here the whole time. And, uh, oh, which one's that? Uh, this is just the, uh, a note on the anti Stratfordians, especially Baconians and Oxfordians. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, there you go. Of the uh, Signet Classics that uh, uh, it too brought, brought me to the Shakespeare authorship question. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I uh, went home and uh, found Thomas Nash, thought that was super interesting. And uh, some time passes uh, before we kind of make any new. Uh, revelations of this and this is when chance was when i first got into it or was asking about it he was you know still in the early stages and then some time passes and he was starting to really like kind of churn out a bunch of the his theories and whatnot and uh, oh yeah to also cap it off in that i am also a thomas nash my first name is brady but my middle name is thomas my last name is nash and hopefully that no one in my audience doxes me but um 
to let y'all know that there's actually not just three Thomas Nashes here on the screen, but you've actually seen a third one now. Uh, and that if you actually look at my hat that I wear at every episode, it is the Houston Rockets logo, the NBA basketball team from the 90s. And that was actually drawn by my uncle. And here I'll throw it up on the screen here. So this, uh, this image here uh, has got kind of a, a retro sort of a endearment around these parts. We're both from Houston. But uh, it's drawn by my uncle, and his name is also Thomas. So he is also a Thomas Nash. So I, yeah, so I have a, an inception. Shout, you know, shout out to Leonetti Graphics. Oh, yeah, there you go. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's what definitely uh, kind of got me going. And so I thought this was really humorous as far as, you know, looking into this. And I'm very interested in the synchronicity phenomenon uh, as coined by Carl Jung. And uh, I definitely have some more synchronicities involved with this story here. But as we go along... Uh, some time passes, and eventually Chance is showing me a lot of this stuff between um, Thomas Decker and Thomas Nash. Now, once again, if you've already listened to the whole thing about all the style metrics and the dates and all this sort of stuff about why we think Decker and Nash are the same. So he's telling me all this, and I had kind of also seen another potential clue in this, in that uh, I was doing kind of research into names and etymology roots. And um, so he's telling me Nat, or Thomas Nash is Thomas Decker. And I point out like, hey, well, they're both named Thomas. And Thomas means twin. So if someone was having a dual personality, it would just be, you know, really uh, on the nose if they were both, you know, like, look, I have two personalities. I am, I am Thomas Decker and Thomas Nash because they're twins or and whatnot. Uh, right. Also a dual, also a, a dual person that, you know, also I'm and not actually either of these persons. I'm another person behind it too. Also, we just have a startlingly large amount of Thomases in this whole That's conversation. That's true. Like, not that people aren't named Thomas, but... Thomas Kidd, Tom, Thomas Watson, Thomas Ashlow, uh, Th Thomas Nash, Thomas Decker, uh, Thomas Middleton. Uh, there's probably more that I'm forgetting. Uh, so, yeah, like at some point, maybe just Thomas is a good pen name because it's a twin name. Uh, like, also, uh, uh, Mark Twain. I've always been suspicious of Mark Twain. Twain meaning two or twin. Uh, uh, I know that's from his uh, paddle boat. Uh, days, uh, riverboat days, Mark Twain's, what you do to mark two meters or yards of depth or something. Um, but uh, Mark Twain also means look, too, uh, and, you know, Shakespeare speaks. So, uh, yeah, my bad, Brady, continue. Thomas Twain. I mean, Mark Twain also relates to, you know, he is one of these Shakespeare doubters as well, yeah, right? So it's, right. All, it's all connects. Right. And so, um, yeah, so Thomas being twin potentially, and what I kind of pointed that out is, yeah, that if... Thomas Decker is Thomas Nash. The name Twin is very uh, on point. And so some more time passes. And eventually, like I said, I've been kind of digging into names. So I was looking at, you know, for whatever reason, I, I just knew what Thomas meant. Um, actually due to my, my uncle, the one who drew the Rockets logo. This involves his son actually a little bit too. His son's name is... Uh, his, his, his son's name is Colby, but his middle name is also Thomas, so he's also a Thomas Nash. And it was often joked that Colby and I, were we looked a lot alike growing up, so just a little more uh, like funny coincidences. Twins. Yes, exactly. And so uh, some time passes, and eventually, uh, yeah, there's this particular week that a lot of, like, cascading sort of research kind of came into a, a, a head. And so I was uh, actually finally looking into what my last name meant, or what this named Nash means, and supposedly it means uh, at an ash, or it, it, it means at an ash tree, or someone that lives by the ash tree. And apparently it has a lot of uh, Scandinavian roots, and that uh, if you ever see this letter, essentially this is important later on, but the, it, 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 it's essentially that these people, you know, Viking raiders and whatnot, and uh, people from Scandinavia would bring over their ash trees and uh, plant them essentially. And so that's where uh, some of these roots essentially come from. But, um, and yeah, and also, so yeah, I'm just showing you here just for fun, but so yeah, if you ever see this, uh, the old, uh, uh, the Ask Us letter, it's also, a, if you wanna show the screen, it's also, if you look on the computer screen, it looks like the, uh, it's called the Ansu's Rune, which kinda looks like an F in the Roman uh, Latin alphabet. But uh, for uh, Norse runes or uh, Elder Futhark runes, yeah, this is what this is what the A E sort of soft A sound derives, or this symbol derives from this old rune. Uh, 
And as you can see, even in the wiki, it says here that it's, yeah, it was called Ask from the Ash Tree itself, okay? So, uh, and my cousin Colby was starting to tell me about a lot of this, you know, Norse Viking uh, lore and, and, and uh, mythology. And so I, I, I started to see some interesting connections and Chance was almost like separately, which is bizarre because I hadn't even gotten a chance to kind of talk to him about it. He was like sending me text real time as I was figuring this out with Colby. So it was, it was really... Uh, real chilling as it was kind of happening. Uh, I, there I see uh, ecstatic, which is sort of where I'm going to lead this into. But when people talk about Shakespeare, especially we're talking post Stratfordian arguments here, one of the homages that people will often uh, attribute to Shakespeare, or literally if you're thinking shaking a spear, they will often say Diana is the one that they or, often get some. Uh, um, or Athena, there you go, um, is the one that gets uh, the, uh, the biggest connection to, but I'm going to be pitching a new uh, sort of uh, connection potentially that I have never seen pitched before, and I'll go into maybe why, but I'm wondering if there's any connections between Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, and the Norse or Germanic pagan god of Odin, okay? Or so Wotan or Wotan Woden. Yes. Um, and so, yes, the English would have called him Woden, I think is what the English, the uh, old Woden. English one. Well, Nas, yeah, tons of uh, different ways of, you know, he's got a billion names that we're about to get into. <laughs> and so um, here, yeah, we've got Odin riding on his eight-legged uh, horse. And he is known for, and I'm going to go to a couple different things here, but he is known uh, as, you know, some of the Norse gods. We know Thor has his hammer, but Odin is known as the, uh, he's basically known for wielding a spear. And his spear is called Gungnir. Uh, where is it? So it's right here. And the spear actually means to, uh, to sway. So maybe to shake and to sway, to, to uh, jostle this sort of like yeah, movement. Uh, maybe we're seeing something here. Oh, maybe I have something else for you. In the uh, uh, poetic Edda tale, it's called the uh, Grimness, uh, Grimness Mall, which is like sayings of the grim one. Uh, Odin calls himself in one of these, uh, this word called Biflindi. And if you look down at it, it potentially means uh, shield or spear shaker. Hmm. Okay. Are hmm. we are we intrigued yet? All right. Hmm. And uh, if you know anything about Odin, Odin is known as the uh, he's known for a lot of things. Maybe because he is a sort of amalgamation of a bunch of different pagan deities that have sort of you know coalesced into one thing. But not, one not too different than Apollo in that sense. And one thing he's known for for certainly is. Um, obtaining the mead of poetry and he is known for also discovering uh, runes as well and so there's very much this sort of uh, connotation of language and uh, writing and because that's what the runes are is a sort of like you know established representation of like exchanging you know you know information right um and so i and once again also the poetry thing kind of hits them so here we kind of have um you know this these these same sort of like attributes that we give Shakespeare right this sort of poetry mastery of words, uh, very much you know uh, a uh, the same sort of pr properties we would give to Odin and in the same sense uh, Odin's or I'm sorry Odin is yeah is a he comes from a Germanic paganism roots essentially uh, even when we call him Old Norse people will think now we we know to properly you know call it Old Germanic you know uh, right. deities o essentially Old Norse or not. Is just one version that's become right. the most popular because Vikings are cool. And but so, uh, yes, uh, this is, you know, gonna, what Brady's talking about predates Vikings. And, uh, and if you think about even what William Shakespeare's name is, his name is, uh, William, which is an old Germanic name, right? So we and literally have, so is Shakespeare apparently like that's the argument that Shakespeare oh, okay. is, you know, from, uh, shocking or chicken to shake. And then, Spear, uh, spear, uh, spar, spear. Um, so that's like a hundred percent Anglo Saxon name, and so, like, this is a real nationalistic thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, here we and have, like, and like, specifically with the name William, like, what, what does William mean, right? Yeah, name? I was about to get into that. Um, yeah, exactly. So, what he's about to talk into is that William literally means the, the, 
William part, the end part means is helm, or it was, used to be Wilhelm, right? So helm is literally helmet, and then will is still very much what we think of today is that, uh, you know. Will, the yeah, spirit of, of doing it. Yeah, exactly. Conscious effort. Agency. Uh, agency yeah. Great one. And and so, yeah, this literally helmet of will, and I, don't, I haven't seen anyone attribute this uh, to in this sense, but once again, we're talking about Odin, and much like Chains and I will sort of pitch is that, you know, there's a sort of like, you know, language sort of powerfulness that is sort of wrapped up in like how we're able to talk to one another. Uh, and if Odin is sort of the one who is discovering runes or discovering language and what does language essentially do, it, you know, anything we do in this sort of uh, meeting between one another like precedes as language in your head. Like we can't like, you know, know how to uh, you know, let alone build sentences, but you know, every single like you know thing your eye touches has to now have a sort of like you know defined sort of uh, you know way of pl placing it for us to sort yeah, of register like, it. You know, uh, if you've ever listened to like any Noam Chomsky or that that sort of stuff, it's like getting into that territory where it's like you know that is what being a modern human is is having this consciousness that's structured with language. Like that's. You know, uh, maybe this is a little Western bias, but that's like our understanding that that's the difference between, say, now and 100,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago, or just say, you know, what's happening in the Western cultured first world or whatever, uh, versus maybe what's happening in some more, uh, I don't want to use any, you know, too um, peerless terms, but like, you know, uh, more primitive, uh, um, more, you know, natural lifestyle. Uh, Paleolithic, Neolithic kind of lifestyle that maybe you see uh, people in Amazon rainforest, uh, people in Papua New Guinea, uh, you know, uh, people in Sri Lanka. Like, their the languages don't have this giant vocabulary, don't have all these syntactical nuances, and uh, don't have you know crazy structured sentence order. Uh, English has the biggest vocabulary on the planet by far. Um, has like the most structured sentence order uh, of any language that can have this sort of complex syntax. Uh, like, it's a super powerfully crafted language. And, like, yeah, that's what, that's what we're getting at here, man. And, it, yeah, and to continue on from that, exactly, is that, so this concept of the will helm, the helm of will is this sort of being able to put it on now with the language granted by, you know, the Shakespeare's or whatever, right? Um, and that yeah, you've like receiving your consciousness through 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 acquisition of language, right? Uh, and through through apple, yeah, through acquisition and application of it too. Uh, dare I say a sort of like magical, you know, effect? You know, maybe uh, some of our occult language or uh, audience will really like some of that angle. Um, and so, yeah, I started to see a lot of these interesting, you know, uh, connections between. Uh, Odin and Shakespeare, I have a couple of other things to read for you, uh, just to kind of, once again, maybe not all of these are going to be like Shakespeare and Odin, blah, 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 but we definitely see some, I, you know, I call them synchronicities, they're fun sort of, uh, you know, where it's, I, I always kind of say like, I, I'll find Shakespeare and stuff where I'm not even trying to find it, you know, I'll, I'll read some book, you know, but the, somehow Shakespeare has managed to find his way into the opening quote of the book that summarizes the whole thing, right, so I always find that. Yeah, but, like, uh, there's a meme going around that like, uh, you know, uh, women had had were given this TikTok memes to each other that was like, "How long does your husband or your spouse or your boyfriend go without saying something that relates back to the Roman Empire?" And it's like I, I'd like to pitch that like even better, regardless of gender or social status. Like, how long do you go without saying something that touches directly to Shakespeare, or very closely indirectly to Shakespeare? Like try it yeah think about it yeah or your favorite movie that you hear or, or watch yeah, or whatever yeah, or favorite story that you come to or, yeah or some saying or some some plot structure or sure yeah even a lot of these modern rap songs are still in iambic pentameter yeah, right so right. <laughs> um but so if i open up this book that's called uh hell runar by jan Fries, it is a like a magic rune manual of rune magic uh, I like this cover a lot because this is the first image you ever see of what's called the Weird Web, which if you relate back to what I liked a lot about the Weird Sisters at the beginning of Macbeth play, which weird is Old English for fate and destiny. Um, so yeah. And so, um, but if I just go here to the uh, the 
the entry for the uh, Ansu's rune, or if we go back to this uh, uh, this entry here. So it's talking about the old uh, the old rune, essentially the one that we were holding up earlier that looks like the F. But I'm just going to read this tiny little paragraph here, and we'll just see if your ears perk up if you hear anything. Um, okay. Um, but in the refined form, this, this rune, of the rune poems, the reference is definitely to Odin, Lord of Valhalla. Odin's principal weapon, the Spear of Will, is also related to the world Ash. Uh, Aska being spear and Aska being ashes. It seems likely that the world Ash was a mountain Ash or Rowan. Oh, so then it goes on. But yeah, it's funny that he was calling uh, Odin's spear called the Spear of Will, literally because supposedly that it would never miss its target, so he could literally direct it, you know, at anything that he so desired. Um, but the the world, it, sometimes they switch it up, but in the, uh, the Norse mythology, the, the world tree that Odin hangs from to receive the the uh, the mystery of the ruins themselves, where he stabs himself with a spear and you know takes out one of his eyes, and um, it, it is sometimes they will definitely just straight up call it the ash tree. So they some people think that the Yggdrasil is an ash tree, uh, but to uh, continue on this sort of mythology train and to connect it back to some of our other writers, if we remember Christopher Marlowe, Christopher Marlowe, um, obviously the first word Christopher being Christ. And then, I don't know if the Topher makes, means anything, but Marlow is an old English word for driftwood. How does it connect back to Odin again? Well, in the Norse mythology, the first man is created by Odin. He finds a piece of driftwood and breathes life and spirit into this piece of driftwood, which is later called, uh, it's like the first man's called Ash, and the first lady's called Elm. And so there you once again have this, uh, so if Christopher Marlow is, you know, Christ driftwood, it's very, once again, kind of funny that I can maybe argue that there's some like you know odin norse you know or dramatic you know heathenry uh mythology going on here again i don't know I don't and, know. and yeah and like yeah just with the spear of war will being related to the world ash it's like the spear of world the spear of will like will shakespeare being related to the world ash like nash like thomas nash like that that's interesting that there you know maybe there's not any literal connection here but we have definitely linguistic connections that are maybe super deeply rooted, but I think that's Brady's point that like if they're that deeply rooted, we have a continuation of a language that you know we say this we you know when you teach English literature like I do, you teach Beowulf, um, and as much as Beowulf sort of still gets read, and as much as you know Chaucer and Gawain sort of still get read. We talk about how Beowulf sort of influences later Middle English or, you know, Anglo-Norman English or even the French lays and that sort of stuff and uh, how it influences Viking poetic eddas. But you very rarely hear about what's the influence of, you know, earlier Anglo-Saxon stuff, specifically stuff like Beowulf. What is that influence on Shakespeare? We have all this classical, you know, research and understanding and in Shakespeare we see all this stuff about Roman playwrights and in Greek playwrights and, and Roman ideas and Greek plot structures and um, you know even even going back to Chaucer medieval stuff but rarely do you see anyone talking about any sort of connection between old England pre Norman England Germanic England and Shakespeare and so Brady's like well I mean I think there's a there's a very literal connection right here. I, I, got, I got a guy shaking a spear that is called the Spear of Will that, like, also, you know, just to connect... As a master of poetry and words and language. And right, and, like, uh, to connect it back to the previous video and Donna Murphy's little Freemasonry, like, clearly we got some sort of blindness trope being worked here with yes. the one-eyed Odin. And so, like, I don't know, this whole idea that all this super iconic, you know hermetic thinking only comes from you know the near east mediterranean um you know th th there may be th you know obviously that's where it's rooted mostly but there may be some other stuff that we're missing that's coming from northern europe coming from gaelic celtic places coming from norse germanic places maybe coming from slavic russian you know um baltic balkan you know th there's stuff all over europe that's going into a lot of these occult esoteric ideas and we're missing it because we're all stuck on roman greece and oh, high flute renaissance but 
Uh, I'll get I'll get Brady back to it. One more thing. Just I was reading Samuel Daniels' defensive rhyme, and like what we're talking about here totally mirrors what Samuel Daniels talking about defensive rhyme. Like the the classics are great, but they can be overrated, and they can have their own faults and flaws. And at some point, like if we want English to be this great thing. You got to go back and find what made it great in the first place. And yeah, it's stuff like this. Um, so what we're saying here maybe isn't all that different from what Samuel Daniels slash Philip Sidney is saying. So back to Brady. Um, yeah, if you want to show them our candle of William Shakespeare. If you uh, see the intro of the video, I have this candle that I got uh, from Galveston. And someone else said that they have this exact candle. So I know that it's not... It's I, it's probably just a mass-made candle that you can get at random gift shops. Um, Philosopher, philosophersguild.com. And so, um, but on the back it says a couple of things about this William Shakespeare on here, and it says um, uh, he's the patron saint of uh, one star-crossed lovers, and if and that's not always supposed to mean like uh, you know happy like oh you know you're my soulmate. That's supposed to be like yeah you're kind of like doomed and you've yeah. got some you know date with destiny type. Uh, uh, Which I believe is from Romeo and Juliet, but that should also totally make you think of Astrophil and Estella. Um, those are both names for stars, and so you know they're star crossed. They never meet. They f they cross and never never get to stop on each other. Um, which yeah, Romeo and Juliet's totally about Philip Sidney and uh, Penelope Devro. I don't know why people haven't recognized that. But back to Brady. And um, so yeah. Uh, Starcrossed lovers, which means, yeah, probably doomed, not supposed to be meta. And I, maybe this is a bit of a stretch for me, but uh, Odin is definitely doomed. He's he's always trying to circumvent his destruction at the end of time or with the, uh, at Ragnarok. And it also says on here that he is also the patron saint of crossdressers, which is just kind of funny because Odin does get pinned as a sort of like, you know, He's a sort of bender of rules, like, you know, he is sort of manly, but he can also, he can wear dresses if he wants, and he gets, he gets, you know, kind of, uh, people like Loki and other people in the sagas will sort of, like, try to, like, you know, pull the, hey, you, you practice all the girl magic, you know, or it's called satyr, and so, uh, Odin is known as practicing the women's magic that he learned, supposedly, from his wife, um, and, and some of these, I don't know if, uh, this could be people just, or like certain scholars just saying that, you know, they think that he's wearing dresses and you will have these old, I don't know if they're, I don't want to say it improperly or go off cuff or, you know, go off, have cocked here, but it's, uh, it'll have like Iron Age, sort of like little, you know, figurines of Odin, but he's, it looks like he's more like wearing a dress and not trousers as would be uh, sort of classical for that. So people think that, yeah, he is a sort of like, you know, in between, so a little trickstery. Uh, maybe how people kind of see Loki today in yeah, a certain sense. And, androgynous for sure. Um, and it also says here that he's, this. once again, we're talking about the Shakespeare candle, but I'm just trying to connect it back to Odin. It also says he's the patron saint of upstart crows. So it's back to the Robert Greene uh, quote there. But uh, Odin is also known as having two ravens that he can send out into the world. And crows and ravens kind of have a very similar sort of uh, uh, connection there just yeah, uh, for blackbirds. Yeah. God of cross dressing and ravens, and William Shakespeare is the saint of cross dressers and crows. Yeah, just for this, yeah, funny gift shop candle that you know, we all can tell me if I'm stretching it or not. And uh, just to continue on, so at this time, uh, it was like during this one week, and uh, this will be the last part of my little personal story here, and that we were just sort of like riffing on some of these connections, just being like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, there, there's um, something here. There's something that happened in the ether. And uh, and I just started to see Thomas Decker. Once again, if you believe that Thomas Decker is Thomas Nash, I just started to see it in weird places that I would just definitely not expect it to see. And so... You know, like all the good research folk out here, I always have a billion tabs of stuff open up uh, here. And I remember I had some of these tabs open up for weeks, and I, it was during the same week. And it was like literally the day before or day after uh, that I began talking about Chance with this earlier this year. And I had this tab opened up, and I was looking at R for a bunch of different artists because I was trying to do some mid-journey stuff. Uh, Mid-journey's uh, AI uh, art generator. And so I, uh, and this is literally what happened. I just, I happened to just have this perfect sequence of clicks. And so I was like, okay, uh, pick on the first guy. So I clicked here, NCYF, uh, went down. I was like, okay, okay. 
oh look uh, he's got some of these first you know uh paintings for treasure island and the like and oh look i remember seeing this at some point during some research earlier which uh check out that name sydney lanier that's interesting Ooh. philip sydney a million lanier maybe you know that's cool um i don't know what the uh, connection is there but yeah but yeah scrolling on down i was like all right let's go check out the guy's works and i see this thing and I'm like, hey, Westward Ho. And I'm like, wow, that's definitely the name of an Elizabethan play here. Uh, I'm definitely sure. So I'm pretty sure I called up Chance and was like, you know, tell me what you know. But if we go look up what this is, it's actually a novel that was written in 1855. So 200 plus years since the play. Uh, it does admit that it is a nod to the uh, to the Westward Ho play written by Webster and Decker. Webster and Decker, and if you look at the, uh, the this little novel here, it definitely has a, a lot of you know some of our favorite uh, wiki entries like Drake and obviously Elizabeth, and it, yeah, it's a little like privateer pri pirate romp. Uh, it seems like a good time, and I uh, was scrolling down just a little further. And uh, adaptations, okay, first now would be adapted, or adapted for the radio. And then uh, the first movie adaptation of the movie was in 1919, Westwood Ho, directed by Percy Nash. I'm like, okay. Hey, like, Nash, shout out. Yeah, getting Nash to Decker again. And so, uh, if we, once again, if we make the Decker-Nash assumptions. And so, yeah, if, you, if you're looking at Percy Nash, there's a bunch of, uh, bunch of big old question marks and prolific career you know that we barely you know have anything about him at all uh you can go look a bunch of this stuff on imdb um and yeah he kind of gets like he gets in trouble he gets censored much like thomas nash yeah uh for making some movie uh some conspiracy theory movie about lord kitchener's death apparently um so any of our uh yeah, yeah just some kind of red flaggy stuff uh and you know this is the early film just like nash is from early theater so uh, yeah a key figure in the creation of the l street studios which is sort of the english uh, hollywood uh scarcity of information on nash and his work has meant film historians have neglected his contributions to the development of british cinema yeah, and so you know this stuff happens uh not just 400 years ago this you know we, we make dark ages all the time um, and um so and I'm kidding. I'm not. So I'm not kidding, audience. Like this is the. It's like the, this may have been like the same day within like the same hour. Uh, I'm also gonna oust me and Chance here, but we are both uh, fans of Magic: The Gathering. Uh, we've been playing uh, for a while. Uh, we play with our other roommate, the guy who made the uh, little intro song. If you're a fan, but um, yeah, and it was just around. It was the exact same day or the day after. I can't probably remember anymore. But I had gone and you know, opened up some browser and I was going to do some research and some cards because I was trying to finish this deck I have here and um, I have uh, I was trying to collect all the rare black dragons because I thought I had obtained them all I had just and so it's funny because Chance is the only person I really play magic with and he's definitely the only person I talk deep Shakespeare stuff about with and so it's funny that I can uh, I'm able to share some of these like weird experiences with him but I um was trying to find out if I had properly traded for all the black dragons that were out there, and so I'm doing a, I'm doing some search, and I find this one I had never seen, and here it is. It's called Eben Dragon, and um, if you know anything about magic, this is not a good card. It's not very good at all. Costs a lot of mana, you know, not very good power and toughness, and doesn't do a super exciting effect. Uh, but the but the picture's pretty cool. I, you know, you don't really quite see this kind of thing, uh, this normal depiction of this tight little, I call it, you know, Godzilla blue beam here. And I have more synchronicities with this image alone, but I'll save that maybe for another day. And I uh, I had seen that there was a newer card, or a new version of this card. So they reprinted this card, and they actually made it all shiny and cool. So then they kind of cleaned up the border. And so, all right, I'll check that one out. And it's the last dragon, I'm going to get this card. Uh, I go click on it, and I started to get blown away here because... If you look down here at the bottom, they have what's called the flavor text. And in Magic, they'll put flavor text. It'll be like in-game, uh, like, quotations. So it'll be like, you know, I'm a Super Fraximus, the Devastator dude, and I'm saying some stuff. Or it's, I'm sure they were once someone important, but I couldn't tell you who they were. Doros Expedition Guide. Yeah, so it's usually like text from, like, the in-game Magic world from its own fantasy uh, thing. I, I all of a sudden look at this card... At the very bottom, it says, The winged dragon of night o'erspreads the earth. Troilus and Cressetta, William Shakespeare. And so I was like, what the heck? I have never seen a magic card that has one flavor text outside of its own 
uh, contextual game world, let alone anything that quotes William Shakespeare. Uh, so this is bizarre, and my hair starts to stand on edge again. And I'm and I know Chance had just been reading Troilus and Cressida like the week prior, so I call him up and I'm like, Chance, uh, Troilus and Cressida, is it in the Henslow Diary? And he's like, Yes, yes, it is. And I go, Who is who is it written by? Because I know that it's going to predate Shakespeare. And guess who it's by? Thomas Decker. So we're back on, yeah, it's the, the same week we were finding all these connections with Odin and Thomas Nash and Thomas Decker and all. Thomas Decker just kept happened to find me in the strangest places. Uh, and so I, I don't know what to really call that exactly. I, I, I'm fascinated with the synchronicity phenomenon, and I'm kind of a big proponent that language itself has something to do with it. And not to go off too off topic, but I think that you know, that is a real big reason when we're kind of getting into this, we touched on like early Freemasonic history tonight and we're kind of getting into like, you know, I'm going up into my wild speculative land here, but I, there is some sort of like uh, association of magic um, and, and language itself. And, and that's why they say, you know, you to you spell a spell with word, right? Uh, you know, you spell words, S-P-E-E-L, are also spells you would literally cast at the same time. So there's a lot of this inherent uh, magical property uh, properties and sort of uh, latent in this whole thing. And so I don't maybe this will we'll wait to this yeah, specific episode to kind of dive into why are all these dies or guys dumping all this, you know, um, not just like shout outs and call outs because you know, they, they're definitely doing that when they're, oh, uh, look, I can put the, the height ratio of the pyramids into the stuff and the blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm down. I'm, I'm down for all this stuff. I believe you. But I want to know more than just like, you know, and not to say it's not impressive to style the text that way, but I'm trying to say that there's like a more like oomph. There's something yeah, else that they really want a out of it. Functional like eschatology coming at the end of this. Yeah. Like, it's it's not just drink your oval teen. It's a heightened sense of consciousness. It's it's what all those uh, you know old, old hippie crackpots of the '60s are trying to get at. And uh, you aesthetics, know, you know, or it, like. Um, can can I bring this full circle here? Um, I'm making these things in real time because every day we're we're learning some new thing to look out for and. Uh, just because I picked up Malcontent because Anderson's reading it and I made those, you know, anti-Oxford readings and I'm only able to make those anti-Oxford readings because I'm reading Patrick Buckridge's essays on both Marston and he has another essay called uh, Christopher Hatton and Edward Dyer, Dyer the uh, first Elizabethan Adonis or something like that. But he suggests that no way Devere wrote Venus and Adonis. Maybe we'll do another video on this. But he says it's because... Venus and Adonis is making fun of Oxford. And so I've been trying to, you know, not, I haven't been actively trying, but now I'm like, you know, anytime I read, is there a passage making fun of Oxford? Let me check it out. And so with Marston's Malcontent, I said, hey, Anderson, go check out, you know, Act 1, Scene 3 and 4, and there's probably more. I just haven't gotten farther into it. Um, but as I'm flipping through Troilus and Cressida, trying to find a juicy line for Brady to really tie this whole Thomas Decker thing full circle... Here's Thersites talking, and uh, Thersites or Tharsites uh, or Th uh, Thersites, uh, I, you know, Thersites, uh, I'm going to call him Tharsites. Um, he's the super biting, almost fool character of the play, and he just says what he wants, and people have said maybe he's mimicking Marston or he's a Marston homage. Uh, maybe he's like, he's... The real Ben Johnson and Ajax is the fake Ben Johnson. I've wondered that, like, you know, the whole poet ape thing. Um, but Tharsides is clearly the wit, and that's where Decker gets to flex. And this is where you really get to see that this is not sh Shakespeare, whatever Shakespeare is defined as. This is specifically Decker within something that we call Shakespeare. And so he said, this is Tharsides that uh, says, Here's Agamemnon, an honest fellow enough. And one that loves quails, but he has not so much brain as earwax, and the goodly transformation of Jupiter there. His brother, the bull, the primitive statue and oblique memorial of cuckolds, a thrifty shoehorning, shoeing horn in a chain hanging at his brother's leg. So he's talking about Menelaus, uh, uh, Agamemnon's brother. But I just want to point out that this directly relates to what Marston's talking about in Malcontent, because uh, Pietro 
who is the uh, usurping duke, um, who I've wondered is standing in for William Stanley, who is the younger brother of Ferdinando Stanley, who's supposed to be the real duke, I guess, maybe. Um, but Pietro's full name is Pietro Giacomo. Giacomo is from the word Jacob, which means literally leg puller or uh, foot grabber or shoe horn or and so we have both shoeing horn and hanging at his brother's leg those both look to me like leg puller um, all of a sudden I'm wondering if this is the same exact allegory that Marston's writing about malcontent uh, but let me see further because remember Marston's making fun of Oxford too and it's not just William Stanley or maybe it's only Oxford not William Stanley but it clearly says something about you know uh, you're an ox, and you're an old ox, and you're a beggar wit all, and you know, you're just an idiot, clown, um, a cuckold. Let me see, what does he say here? He says, Menelaus, his brother, the bull, the primitive statue, an oblique memorial of cuckolds. Cuckolds. Thrifty shoeing horn in a chain hanging at his brother's leg, leg puller. To what form but that he is should wit larded with malice, and malice forced with wit to turn him to? To an ass were nothing. He is both ass and ox. Okay. To an ox were nothing. He is both ox and ass. To be a dog, a mule, a cat, a fitchu, a toad, a lizard, an owl, a puttock, or a herring without a row. I would not care, but to be Menelaus, I would conspire against destiny. Ask me not what I would be. If, uh, if I were not Thersides... For I care not to be the house of a Lazar, so I were not Menelaus. Heyday, sprites, and fire. So, uh, yeah, right there, got a nice juicy passage that's clearly written by Decker in Troilus and Cressida, which Brady is, you know, can't help but see when he's just trying to play magic with <laughs> his brother-in-law. Just just trying to have a good time, trying trying to, you know, pull, pull out some cards with, with his old roommates, me, me and Jamie. And, nope. Uh, yeah. Nope, Decker's coming in, and pfft. and so just like we said, you know, earlier, it should be a meme go a day without seeing Shakespeare. That's what we're saying too, though, about Decker, and it's crazy. Like Decker's not supposed to be like Shakespeare; he's just some guy, right? No, Decker is not just some guy. He is the guy, and he's one of the most important writers in the Shakespeare canon. Um, so one day we'll figure out just who Decker is, but. I sure want to point out that if we got some more of the theaters and Marston and Decker are on one side and Ben Johnson's on another side and these two are making fun of Oxford, maybe Ben Johnson's Oxford, but that would be a little weird because sure is a lot of connections with Ben Johnson and the Sydney circles. So getting hard to say where Oxford is in this whole situation, but if you think Oxford wrote Shakespeare... Uh, fine, but he didn't write this one. Nope. Ouchie. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, if yeah, anyone has any more notes on like yeah, the Odin connection, uh, Google my search is thrown off because when you type in Shakespeare and Odin, you just get the 1990s remake of Othello. It, the name of the title, the title of the movie is just called O. Starring Josh Hartnett, and Julia Stiles, and uh, was it Mackay Pfeiffer? Yeah, and they renamed the character Othello, and it's a modern rendition, so it takes place in the 90s or whatever. But the main character is renamed to Odin. So if I ever was trying to find anything to do with Shakespeare and Odin, my, it's, it's gone. Like, the only thing that ever comes up is that, or movie reviews of that movie, and it's highly frustrating. <laughs> so, and, you know, uh, interesting, because Othello is specifically this racial context, and, uh, um, giving the Othello character a super Germanic name. Yeah, like very, Odin. yeah. Uh, that's super hot button. But uh, uh, also, uh, if you do teach Othello to high schoolers, let them watch that movie. They will like Othello better. I, I can say that from personal experience. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, so we have one more Thomas Nash I meant to get to, which was uh, he was the first husband of William Shakespeare's granddaughter, apparently. And uh, they have some little... Like, gift shop house for him, I think, in Stratford. Yeah, there's weird little, like, spooky connections with the the Shakespeare family and, like, the, you know, the, the weird kind of rural stuff, like, you know, Giles Fletcher being a distant relative of Shakespeare. And, uh, um, you know, one day we'll have to talk about Fulk Greville. You know, he's Sidney's buddy, and Fulk Greville's supposed to be, like, 
uh, from Stratford or, you know, has, has a lot of say in Stratford. And so uh, at some point, all these Stratford connections and Shakespeare's probably just from Fulk Greville, but we'll get to that another day. Um, but yeah, go back to his, his grave thing. Uh, the grave of Thomas Nash, first husband of Elizabeth, granddaughter of the poet. Like, what a loser. Like, I, I don't want to want to crap on this guy too much, but if you're ever remembered because of your wife's grandpa, um, you didn't do... <laughs> like, uh, hey, hey, he was 14, older, 14 years older than his 18-year-old bride, apparently. <laughs> very Francis Bacon of him. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shout out. But, uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap up this episode for us. Yeah, hopefully that you were all as entertained as I was and captivated as I was when Chance first brought this to me. And shout out to all those essays, yeah, that he dug up. And uh, uh, I don't know if how about I don't know if it's really digging her up. I don't want to say that, yeah, she's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, click on the Percy Nash thing real quick. You, he mentioned this earlier. I don't, I don't know if we mentioned it in the video, but, like, I was saying we, I want to find more Henry Percy, and then we got this weird Percy Nash thing. Uh, reminds me a little bit of Raymond Chandler, Philip Marlowe, where you, you know you take two Elizabethan names and you just smush them together, and that's how you get a, a new fictional name. Um, what's his name? That, um, um, the guy that go picks up from Raymond Chandler, Robert B. Parker. He does the same thing for his main character, uh, Spencer. I don't think mm -hmm. he ever divulges a first name, but... If he did have a first name, I assume it would be from the Elizabethan era. Um, so yeah, uh, if you are into onomastics and you do any creative writing, highly recommend that as a character naming device. If you're trying to make any sort of, you know, twentieth century or previous English speaking character, it's a it's a it's a pretty strong device. Um, I think that wraps it up. I'm. So glad you guys uh, tuned in till the finish here. If you did, if you didn't, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to ghosts. Um, I think that this was sort of, you know, a good step up to our big one that we're going to come up with soon. This is sort of a, a half mic drop. It's definitely a big one. Not anybody out there talking about Decker too loudly. Not on the YouTube circuit, at least. Um, thank you to Donna Murphy. I don't know if Donna's still around, but you're doing excellent work. Uh, at some point, though... I think we got to dive further and start assuming that these are frontmen and pen names. Um, also, just any of you folks that just do generic Shakespeare studies and aren't even worried about the sack question, like start asking what is the role of Anglo-Saxon literature in Shakespeare? You know, like uh, that Cotton Library fire where a bunch of stuff's burned. Uh, Beowulf and Gawain are in there, and like. Um, Shakespeare stuff is in there too. Uh, a lot of stuff gets burnt in that fire. And like, what, what is the connection between that era and this new modern English that's so revolutionized by classicism? If, if we could maybe unpack that process and transformation, um, we might have a way better understanding of where we're at and where we've been and all that. And, um, I think the first step to doing that may be doing what Bray's doing, go digging up suit. Where exactly do we see Odin-like concepts, uh, old Norse concepts, old Anglo-Saxon concepts? And at some point, um, you know, channel your inner Carl Jung and don't try too hard to dig. Let it come to you. Let the synchros happen. Uh, let the coincidences mount up so you can't handle it and you say, all right, I got to dig into this because um, it might get you somewhere. What's the name of that detective from Twin Peaks, the actor that plays him? Because that's kind of his uh, oh, line of, or that's how he does his yeah, stuff. I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name either. Uh, but, uh, I mean, speaking of yeah, the Saxon connection, here you go. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, clearly, like, there is something happening here. We have Hamlet. The greatest of Shakespeare's isn't from a classical Italian. Maybe that's the big difference between his great tragedies and John Webster's great tragedies or his great tragedies and Marlowe's great tragedies. Like, um, almost all of them are about non-Germanic things and, uh, non-British things. And maybe Shakespeare's two best are totally about Germanic or British things. Um, and not just, you know, Norman French stuff. Cause even when Marlowe does English histories, it's still very, Norman French. Uh, and not that Shakespeare doesn't do that too, but Lear, Macbeth, Hamlet. 
guys, that's that's old English. That's old Celtic. That's not Roman. That's not Greek. So uh, yeah, thanks, Brady, for tying this all together. And uh, um, yeah, I think we can end it here. Thanks, folks. Uh, keep watching. Keep staying tuned. Uh, the hype train's rolling for that next video. Uh, won't give too much away other than going to be some Sydney stuff, going to be some Dyer stuff, going to be some D stuff, going to be some uh, Sonnet stuff. Brady's going to have a bunch of Secret Society kind of esoteric occult stuff, Rosicrucian, Masonic, um, geopolitical European kind of espionage stuff. So it's going to go a bunch of cool, fun, deep places on external and internal Maybe have to split that into several videos. We'll see. Um, but thanks for watching, guys. Y'all stick around. Uh, new videos coming up. And uh, yeah, keep digging. Uh, Brady, lead us out before I take us forever. <laughs> Just like these uh, Proto-Masonic Royal Society guys always tell us. Uh, Nullius and Verba. <laughs>